Hi. If all the world is a stage and we're just those touring players strutting our hours upon that stage, then surely the job in this world to have is the job my guest tonight has. He writes the lines for all those strutting players. He's a guy who took a Montreal neighborhood few people have even heard of and made it famous by turning it into the setting for his very successful and usually quite edgy family dramas. <laughs> I love it. I love it. it that, that's what, what drives me to keep writing about um, people from Villamar. It's, it's, you know, it's my, it's my territory. It's what I know best. It's what I understand the most. And so I, I will keep exploring that until I feel I have nothing more to say. You're up from my school. Pictures, uh, James Lane. I feel very, uh, very comfortable. You know, it, 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 it's, it's where I, it's where I've grown up. It's where all my, my, the characters I've written about, you know, come from. This is uh, the this, real thing. This is the real thing. This is Baroma. This is uh, I actually mentioned Baroma in my first play. Everyone knows Vittorio Rossi at Bar Roma. He's a playwright who's become something of a celebrity in the Italian neighborhood of Villemar. His plays are about the people he knows here. I can't speak for the other Italian communities. I don't know them that well. What I do know is Villemar. And in Villemar, we're dealing with, uh, with, some, with a lot of Italians who have kept to their culture very, very strongly. When you look around here, uh, you know, the decor, it's, it's very Italian, you know. It, it's, uh, sure they're, very, they're very, very proud of that. Are you going to Italy? If this deal comes through. Well, in two weeks. Did you talk to your mother? No. You can discuss this with your brother and sister, not with your own father. I was going to Bellina Pignitore. Look, guys, I'll meet you there. Wait, we'll leave together. Marco, ha, come with me. Ha, come with me. Ha, have Will you listen to your father? Don't you ever tell me what to do in this house again, you hear me? Never. Marco, what is wrong with you? Shut up! Shut up! You shut your mouth and stop meddling in my business. Vittorio Rossi, welcome to Sunday night. Thank you, Dennis. That's a scene, of course, from The Last Adam, your latest play, and there's a lot of passion in there. Yeah, not unlike uh, what I've been able to uh, see within my own family confines, yeah. It, Your family was like that? In terms of the passion, sure. I mean, when one needs to get something done or something said, uh, there are no limits with, uh, uh, in terms of uh, how to get to that place. <laughs> yeah. By shouting and getting excited. And whatever it takes, whatever it takes. If, if it takes shouting, then shouting will, will do. If not, then if it's going to be a more intellectual approach, then that will do. But there's, uh, uh, let's just say that when it, com when it comes to emotion, uh, those passions are, are multiplied quite um, highly uh, in, in, in the circumstances that are very important to them, to me. And yet it's been said, or I think you've said that you were, as a kid, you were really shy and yeah. quiet. Yeah, yes. I, well, I, I was, I, I grew, my father's side of the family seems to be more um, up, up front, you know, more out there. Uh, my mother's side is more, more cerebral or uh, a shyer type, and I take more from my mom's side in that way. And um, my father always criticized me for that, of course. <laughs> the plays are, all, most of your plays, I guess all of them are set in Villemar or set in the community that lives in Villemar. Sure. A lot of people, though, don't even know where Villemar is. No, they don't. Where, tell us about, where is it, first of all? It's, uh, it's in the southwest end of the city. It's, it's between Verdun and Villasau. And uh, it neighbors uh, St. Henry, and, uh, and next to that you got Point St. Charles. So, uh, um, actually, the school I went to, the neighborhood, the school was in St. Henry, which served for the kids in Villamard. So it's, it's, just, it's crunched between the larger communities of La Salle and uh, Verdun. But how does it remain its own place, then? Well, the roots, the roots of Italians in Villamard go way back. I mean, even before the 50s, um, um, the Italians that, have, that still live there 
uh, are, I mean, they've been there for a long time. You know, I mean, there, there, there were Italian families who've, uh, who settled there in the 50s, for instance, and then once they got secured in some, some profession, some job, and they got some money, they would move on to other neighborhoods like La Salle or NDG or St. Leonardo or whatnot. But those who've, who stayed there have been there for a long time with, and they've maintained that, that, rich, that richness of um, you know, culture and stuff. In The Last Adam, the, the play this season at the Centaur, there's a, uh, there's a line that says, in September, Ville Mar looks like the tomato capital of the world. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and the play opens on a big, like, tomato sauce scene. Tomato right? season, yeah, yeah. It's a major event. I mean, it lasts anywhere between two to four weeks, depending on how many tomatoes that a particular family makes. Uh, my mom's been doing it for the last mm, at least 15 years. Uh, we haven't bought a can of tomatoes in at least that amount of <laughs> but time. But how much tomato sauce can you eat in one year? <laughs> a, lot, a lot. Well, you have to understand, you have to understand though, it, 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 they're also given away. I mean, you know, my, my brother comes and takes a few dozen boxes, and then my sisters, and I take what I need. So, so it's spread around. It's spread about, but, but it's used quite frequently. It's not always for tomato sauce. Though. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you grew up in Ville Mar. You went to James Ling High School in St. Henry. How did a kid like you from Ville Mard, figure out that, hey, the theater's for me. This is something I want to do. What, what was the spark for you? It, uh, it was way back in elementary school. Uh, I, didn't, I don't think I formulated in my mind that, um, you know, the theater, for instance, but my earliest recollection was in the third grade, and our class would be uh, divided into groups of five or six, and we would write sketches, and. Uh, and build our own props and costumes, and then we'd present them, the, the, the skits, to the other groups. And In grade I, three? Grade three. My teacher at the time was a lady named Mrs. Booker. I'll never forget her. And we, uh, we would perform them in front of the other uh, groups, and I remember taking a lot of charge in that. And I found my years in grade school, in Villamar, St. John Bosco, uh, to be very creative very extremely creative in, in, in all sorts of areas in poetry and I remember I remember in fifth grade we started meddling in haiku you know poetry and uh, I mean, I'm no poet but <laughs> <laughs> but you are right does Mrs. Booker know what she started I, I know I don't know I have, I have no idea where she is I'd love to find out one day but uh, wherever she is I salute her you know uh, she uh, she was very important in that way the school was quite creative in that way it's when we went on to high school where things changed. That's when you uh, pretended you wanted to be an electrical engineer and went to <laughs> high, went to Sejep in science. Is that, is that well, right? I was I was actually accepted at uh, at in Sejep for uh, uh, to study pure and applied sciences. I lasted three days. I couldn't. <laughs> I mean, I respect that profession immensely. It's, I mean, my father's car was a carpenter, and so I I I, I lived with uh, construction. Uh, workers all my life, carpenters, um, uh, plumbers, designers, all sorts. Creators in their own way. Yes, very much so, yes. So I, I, I had that instilled in me, and I realized after graduating high school that though I was fascinated with it intellectually, it really wasn't in my heart. So when I met my, my teachers in Seja for the first three days, I just said, no, no, who am I fooling? <laughs> <laughs> but was that, a was that a disaster or a crisis at home when you went home after three days and Sejab said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting out of this? I didn't tell my parents. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, what I did is I, uh, I didn't quit. You see, what I did is I just changed program. So I went into, I finished off that year doing creative arts. This was at Dawson College. And um, I, they didn't was, know. No, they thought no. you were in electrical I was, engineering. Because they still saw they still saw me going to school, coming home with books. They weren't looking at the books, or whatever. I go straight to my room and study, you know, whatever. So the following year, I enrolled in the theater program at the school, and that's when I had to tell them because now we're dealing with different hours. You're talking about rehearsing till like real late, and um, you know, doing crew work for plays and stuff. And yeah, I had to somehow give them a reason why I was coming home so late. Certainly wasn't studying in the library or something. And of course, that uh, totally surprised my father. My mother, of course, was very, very um, um, supportive. <laughs> she was. Your father. Uh, your father grew to support you, though, didn't he? Now, yeah, his biggest fan now. But I had to prove to him that um, 
that I, that this was something I could do and do well. Yeah. One of the things you also had to do to be a playwright was to sell shoes at the Bay for six years? Mm hmm Well, uh, I supported myself as a student during, uh, what, two years of Sejab, three years of university, and a year after that. Um, it helped pay my schooling, uh, helped pay certain bills at, at home and any personals I needed to buy, whatever. Helped, had helped me pay my trips to New York. I'd go every year to New York and watch plays. I'd see 20 a year, Broadway, off-Broadway. So I, I know a guy in, in the business I'm in who always says, oh, I should go and sell shoes. I can't take this anymore. Oh. I wonder what selling shoes is like. What do you learn about yourself? What do you learn about all the people who are buying shoes? Oh, you learn a lot. <laughs> oh, it's, 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 I think selling is the, one of the toughest. Uh, you know, Arthur Miller once said uh, many times about his play, Death of a Salesman, he was always asked, uh, what is Willie Loman selling? What's in the suitcase? And his response was simply himself. In other words, dramatically, it's not important that you know the details of what he's selling. All they refer to in the plays, I'm showing the line. But when he said I'm selling himself, I learned that. It's true. Um, Even when you're selling shoes? Well, if you're on commission, if you're on commission, if you're on salary, I mean, you don't care. You, you just, whether you sell or not, you're still getting a salary. But if you're on commission, you have to put up a brave face. You might have had the most horrendous argument the day before, night before, and you've got to come in and sell to make your quota. Now, how do you do that but not selling yourself? It's very difficult. I, 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 I knew doing it, it was just a part-time job, but I knew I couldn't make a profession. I wasn't really a salesman. But you did support yourself until you became a successful playwright. That's true. Yes, yes. Sunday night, we'll be back with Montreal's own shoe salesman and playwright, Vittorio Rossi, who turned his experiences as that shoe salesman into the material for his 1990 hit play, Scarpone. <laughs> Sunday night's back with Vittorio Rossi, one of Canada's leading playwrights, also, though, an accomplished actor. You probably remember him, the street-smart Dino Marone in Urban Angel, a CBC TV series set right here in Montreal. So what's the problem? Come on, man, I can't sell that model. Look, everybody knows it rusts out. Yeah, well, you should have thought of that before you borrowed the car. I got in my life, man. Hey, you're there. You're a music lover, right? What about your buddy? Eh? Well, today's your lucky day. Just so happens I came into possession of some CD players, and they're going at a special winter price. You interested? Uh, you a uh, stereo salesman? And a man who's speaking, yes. Uh, no, yeah, I don't think Wait, so. wait, wait, Vic. Just because you don't get paid enough at the trip to take advantage here, don't stop me from making a sale. Mm -hmm. What is it you do? Oh, I, I work for the city. Work? Work? You guys spend most of your time on the picket line. My department isn't allowed to do that. Well, what department is that? Police. <laughs> <laughs> Did you like that role uh, in, in Urban Angel you had? Yeah, it was very fun. Fun role, yeah. Yeah, yeah, very much so. He was the fence. He was the uh, sm street smart Italian guy who was the fence, right? Yeah, but it, it was also, yeah, that's true. It was, but it was also, at least the way it was written, it was also the character that helped diffuse some tension and stuff, you know, for some comic relief or humor or whatnot, you know. But it was fun. Um, I remember when we did the movie, uh, which I, which this was sort of based on, uh, Malarek and, and the real Victor Malarek telling me about that real person. Who was not completely bad and not completely good, right? Oh, but when he told me about this real person, I couldn't believe it. So why the hell was I cast? I can't do this. So, <laughs> so I just had to use my imagination to make something else work, you know? Yeah. What, uh, what happened to Urban Angel? Why didn't it catch on? It was canceled after, what, 13, 26 weeks? Yeah, uh, it was, yeah we, we did something like, uh, I believe it was 15 episodes in the course of two, two seasons. I don't know, it's tough to say. I mean, I, I don't know if it was really given a proper chance um, to, uh, 
to go out there and uh, to succeed. I, I don't know. I mean, well, what do you think was it? The acting, the production, the script. I mean, so, there's so many, so many things go in. So many factors go into a TV series. Yeah, you were there right inside it. Well, uh, I think the writing could have gone further. I, I, I really believe that. I think it could have gone further. I think uh, uh, they could have um, developed the characters in a more, in a, with, a, with a little bit with a richer, um, uh, you know, richer, with more texture. What about yourself? Do you think you stereotyped yourself by taking that role? Have you stereotyped or typecast yourself now? Uh, well, the bottom line, Dennis, is that is that uh, the only roles I'm ever sent in for here are Italians, anyway. So, so uh, whether it's whether it's my fault, whether it's my type casting myself or other people doing it for me, I don't know. I I never went into this thinking that I, that was all I was going to play all my life. There's two ways to look at this, in my opinion, when it comes to any movie or any play or whatnot. There's, and I can't think of any other way. One is that the, the ethnic quality, the ethnic background of the character is an actual um, ingredient of the storytelling, of the telling of the story. In other words, if I am to see uh, the remains of the day, those actors must convince me that they're English, from England, at a certain, a certain kind of education and whatnot. So you cast accordingly. Obviously, it was a brilliant job. <laughs> Similarly, you do something like uh, an Italian-American mafia story, you have to cast accordingly. Then there are other types where the, the background of the character is not pertinent to the telling of the story. So it doesn't matter if you cast, you know, Hoffman or De Niro or Redford. It's just a question of taste and who you think can do the job. So, but based on that, uh, I communicate Italian to the local people here, and that's all I do. But, what, but wouldn't you like to try some other roles? Of I mean, course. All, you would like to be an actor as well as a playwright. Sure. Are you ever going to get a role that isn't Dino Moroni? I honestly don't know. I mean, I, I can only control what I do as a writer. Um, if I choose to cast myself in something I write, uh, at least on stage, then I can, ex I can grow as an actor. But I, 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 I'm not uh, totally... Uh, optimistic about uh, how the people out there look at me. <laughs> what about your plays then? Are they, I mean, they are about what you knew and where you grew up, uh, the area or the family, <clears throat> the type of culture you grew up in. Is that a handicap or is it freeing? Is that something that hems you in when you write or is it something that liberates you? Oh, no, it's quite liberating actually because what it, it, it gives me a, a focus to begin with, a very specific focus and it's from there that I can then um, allow my imagination to to take me all to all sorts of avenues uh, and and I, I always believe that it's only in, in this in the specifics that you then communicate universal um, uh, you know qualities I I don't know any other way to work it I'll tell you honestly so that if I uh, you know, I never lived in Brooklyn or Yonkers, and yet I see a Neil Simon comedy, and I'm totally laughing, you know, uh, off my chair. Uh, and I've never lived in Ville Mar, and I see your play, and I laugh, and I understand, and I, and I exactly. feel. Exactly. So yeah. you don't you don't worry about no. stereotyping or or exploiting ethnic differences or ethnic no. characteristics no, in an unfair way. No, no, I don't know. I, I don't think of them as a stereotype. I feel w uh, what I do is, uh, is an honest uh, reaction and study of what I know uh, well. See, we have to also understand that on, on to my knowledge anyway, on the Canadian stage, um, I don't know how many plays are out there that deal with Italians. Uh, so you finally put them on stage and right away, boom, you're dealing with a stereotype. It doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, because it's the first of its kind. It's I, not I a guess. stereotype, then. No, to me it's not. I mean, I would ask the question to those who, who, uh, who accuse me of stereotype, as have they ever been to the Lamar? Have they have actually talked to these uh, people I write about? Uh, my, I would hazard a guess as no, I don't think they have. One of the things in, in The Last Adam, two of the, of the characters in The Last Adam are in their mid-twenties and they're still living at home. Mm. And you lived at home for a long time too and lived <laughs> in Ville Mar until just yeah. last year. What's the, uh, what's that all about? 
I don't know. Uh, we're not married. I, <laughs> I, 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 the, the only real legitimate reason to leave home was to get married. Um, that's the truth. That's, that's the honest truth. Um, I, I had to leave because I just couldn't work there anymore. <laughs> Why not? They wouldn't. They kept asking you when you're getting married. No. Too noisy. It was getting too noisy. I had your nephews coming over, your night nieces, whatever. And, and, and I had work to do. I had deadlines to meet. And I said, look, I need my own place. So I'm, I'm still there a lot. I still go to visit a lot. And I still go to get my tomatoes. <laughs> you miss it, in a way. You, you grew up in that community. You miss it a bit? Oh, well, actually, I haven't had time to miss it because I, I'm not, I, I mean, I live downtown. I don't have, I mean, I'm only five minutes away by car. It's not, it's no big deal, really. But it is quite a different uh, feeling getting up in the morning, hearing honking of cars and stuff, and, uh, you know, out the window as opposed to uh, a, a little bit quieter neighborhood in Villamard. But, um... There's someone to look after you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I always feel in Villamard my car is safe, you know. <laughs> what about Montreal? Can you stay here in Montreal now and do what you want? Uh, yes. As a writer, yes. As a writer, definitely. As an actor, no. No, it'd, uh, it'd be suicide. But I, I, I made my living mostly in the last five years as a writer. So, I, I, I mean, if an acting thing, gig comes along I'll, I mean, and it appeals to me, I'll, I'll do it. I'll take it. In many ways, the Centaur gave you your start, too. By, I mean, you won a couple of prizes. The Centaur made you the playwright in residence, and you almost couldn't write when you were there, either. It was tough, yeah, it was tough. I mean, I, I, I was um, under a lot of pressure. I had won two awards with the one actors, and um, I, I, I now I was offered this job by Morris Podbury at Centaur to be playwright in residence, and suddenly there was this enormous uh, pressure in that I was actually being paid for the first time in my life to do to work in the profession with which I chose. And th that all seemed so strange to me. I felt suddenly I had to prove something. You certainly I, proved it, didn't you? My guest tonight on Sunday night, Vittorio Rossi, Montreal playwright. Good night. Join us again next week. Thank you, Vittorio. Oh, thank you, Dan. That was great.